the writing's on the wall. People, it's like the tide. People are, it's going to wash in because there's so many benefits to it that sooner or later, it's all going to go that way. So the smarter groups, the smarter countries will get in early on these, these kinds of things and really uh, take advantage of them for their students. Some institutions are under the gun because they have no more students. Let me say that one more time. They don't have any students because they didn't keep up with the changes in society. The 21st century student is not the 20th century student. And with that, while some students still want that physical on campus, live in the dorm, college experience, there's a much broader uh, population of students that don't want that or are seeking alternatives and they want to be able to have an innovative sort of educational experience. The classroom lecture kind of experience is, is more of a 20th century model. We're trying to lower the cost of a degree, all right, because right now um, the systems in place are charging a price that keeps the system going versus what is actual for the student. Okay, so the price of degrees have really gone through the roof. Online learning touches every dimension of the university because it's about learning and it's what the university and what the college and all higher education institutions do is, is to promote learning. And I think that there's a role for everyone to play, but I think if there's going to be um, an important role that uh, leadership can play, it's to promote the discussion, it's to provide leadership, it's to create a vision that people can get behind. What you don't measure is just a wishful thinking. So you need to measure what you aspire to achieve because otherwise you're not going to have a chance to uh, validate that you are there and or to improve upon what, you, what, what you're doing. So all of that comprises a system that clocks at different speeds from the KPI very tactically on a daily basis and others uh, more uh, on, you know, on the, uh, longer perspective times. Um, we, uh, we're doing, I have to say that uh, we've been doing the outcome assessment, which is the major internal assessment vehicle that we have. Uh, we've started that three years ago, and I can say that uh, we're still at the beginning. Although we are moving really fast, I would say that um, as a for-profit institution, we're probably moving twice or three times faster than a um, uh, traditional institution. We decided to look at, for say the marketing job, what marketing job would they come out with? We looked at a government database by the Department of Labor called the ONET database, which determined for that specific job, what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities are needed. We then um, worked those together for the different majors and worked those knowledge, skills, and abilities into competencies. We then added external certifications for each one of those majors and took the knowledge, skills, and abilities to that and added that to our pool to determine what competencies were needed. Uh, we ended up with, for a bachelor's degree, typically 55 to 60 competencies are needed to graduate. We are using a direct assessment method. Um, a university like Western Governors is using uh, competency by credit, 
So each competency equates to a credit hour. Direct assessment determines that you can do it, the competency, and it doesn't necessarily tie to a credit hour. Uh, it's another different way of looking at it. Teachers, I think it's uh, important that you think about your expectations and learning objectives. Because we, very, we tend to be very optimistic about what technology can do for us, but a lot of things, technology actually takes a lot of time for us. So it's answering emails is even becoming more <laughs> than less. Be, being something on a platform doesn't mean that you have less work um, on your own. And the other thing is, um, it opens many other opportunities and many other doors. Like I really learned myself a lot. Uh, what it does it mean to be a good speaker, good presenter, good teacher, and how to speak shorter. I think the challenges are significant and, and uh, one of the goals uh, for, you know, people who work in this area is to try to make it easier for faculty members to do this uh, because their time is really limited and so you know the more work it is uh, the less likely they are to uh, engage in this. We can talk about cost and talk about access to higher education and how it impacts that. But even those who are in our institutions and have a, are already here, there's evidence showing that it impacts their academic success because they are forced to make decisions about, uh, they're forced to do things like not buy a textbook or to try to get by without one for as long as possible or to borrow one from a friend, share one with a friend or to try to use one that's two versions old, or you know all the things that they try to do, or download a pirated copy of one. Um, all of those kind of put themselves at some risk somehow, academic risk. And so um, that's really what it's all about. Using and fully leveraging the tools of the day to make sure that as many people as possible have access, that the costs are as low as possible, and that the quality is as high as possible. So that's referred to as the, the iron triangle, right? Cost, quality, and access. And the traditional way of thinking about that is when one of those increases, by definition, the other two have to decrease. So uh, the traditional way of thinking about money is if, if I'm going to improve quality, then it's either going to cost more or I can serve fewer people, right? And with OER, we, we reject that iron triangle. We have to move away from our not invented here attitude about content, and we need to move to proudly borrowed from there. And proudly borrowed from there is the best professors in the world, the best teachers in the world, take content from everywhere, and then they synthesize it into something that's gonna make sense for their students in their country, in their learning environment. And if we're not doing that, we're doing a disservice to the public's trust, and we're, we're wasting the public money, and we're doing, most important, a disservice to our students. thing is leadership. If their president and the chief academic officer are not committed to this, it won't be very effective because one of the big obstacles is faculty resistance. Faculty are used to teaching face-to-face -face in a traditional manner and they oftentimes don't want to or are intimidated by online teaching so they resist. So if the administrators aren't ready to you know, help uh, those people overcome that barrier, and there's a lot of ways administrators can do that. Uh, <clears throat> we look at uh, decision-making processes within the institution. Is this institution open to doing something different? And can they 
manage a project like this. So if they had other examples, maybe they run an off-campus satellite program, or maybe they do an evening weekend program for adults. Do they have experience doing something a little bit different, and they've learned how to manage that as an organization? We look at some, uh, at their ambition. Ambition is a, a key item here. If, if the institution, especially the institutional leaders, maybe the board of trustees, uh, is anxious to do something different, anxious to grow, typically it's a growth question where they're, they want more resources, they want more students, they want more uh, dollars, so then they are committed to, and they, if they're only going to add like 50 students and they want to do a little dabbling in the field, it won't be helpful for us to work with them. But if they have ambitions, like we want to add a thousand online students, then they're committed to doing some things that, that they need to do to get there. You know, right now the model is, is, is a professor goes in and they reinvent the wheel for the thousandth time you know, when you're teaching intro to psychology that's been taught for 40 years by thousands and thousands of professors and everyone's starting from scratch. So, for instance, in what, ed what education is actually doing now is that whoever, come, whoever follows Don in is not going to start from scratch. I mean, it, it's much more, in some ways, a research-built model because, like in research, you build on the shoulders of other people, and that's what we're doing with this, so that when people come in, they're not starting at ground level. It doesn't mean they're going to be out of a job because there's always going to be those, those teaching puzzles out there that are going to need to be solved and have more time to find out where the obstacles are. So what this means is, is we're becoming much more cost effective and getting more for what we're actually doing uh, rather than being something that is uh, kind of haphazard in many ways.